This is the Archimedes A305, an ARM-based PC released in 1987. It was the first RISC-based home computer. Looking inside it, you see something that was common in the early days of personal computers, four separate processors. You have the CPU, the video processor, the memory controller and the I.O. controller, all as separate units. Some computers of the 80s even had more processors like a second memory controller. The world's first true SOC C or system on chip with a CPU on it was created precisely by ARM a few years later in 1992. The ARM 250 had a single core CPU, the video processor, the memory controller and the I.O. controller all in one piece of silicon rather than as separate units as we saw in that earlier model. It comes as no surprise that ARM were the first to create such a product because the low power consumption and small size of their chips were requirements to fit so many processors into such a small area. Area. Why create an SOC? The economic advantages are obvious. It's a lot cheaper to produce a single piece of silicon with all these units rather than four separate ones. And of course, a single chip also takes up a lot less space on a motherboard. And just like economics led to the creation of the SOC, economics again are bringing us full circle, with the next generation of high-end desktop processors now taking some of these components out of the SOC, like the IO controller on the upcoming Ryzen 3000 series. Except this time, instead of going back to the motherboard, it's staying in the same package. This is what's known as an SIP, or System in Package. The SIP is nothing new, of course, but it is the first time we are seeing it in high-end consumer desktop parts. It represents a complete change in the way technology will progress when it comes to performance, at least for the mainstream market. We're getting to a point where the cost of scaling is too high for most companies to bear, and the solution that AMD farm, for example, is to do some of the processors in 7 nanometers, what we call chiplets, and others, in this case the I.O. chip, at the cheaper 14 nanometer process. While AMD is moving to a 2.5D package, Intel is moving to a 3D one, where processors will be placed in different layers of the substrate, vertically, stacked on top of each other. In an ideal world, the semiconductor companies would come together and create standards for these packages. Packages. For instance, you could have a package with an AMD x86 CPU, an NVIDIA graphics chip, and a NARM coprocessor. Is this what the future will look like? A coming together of chiplets into custom packages? Well, yes and no. The problem, of course, is intellectual property. If the IP is available to be licensed, as in the case of ARM, then you will see systems in packages from many different companies and startups that use standardized components alongside licensed. IP. If you watched my last video, you'll know that there are strong signs indicating that discrete GPUs will become obsolete within the next decade. As this happens, NVIDIA will need to decide whether they will go up market and only sell extremely expensive high-end GPUs and nothing else, or if they adopt an IP licensing model similar to the one ARM uses, where they design the cores and license them to other companies to produce the actual chips. One thing is for sure, it's getting too expensive to develop microprocessors in these new nodes, and the performance advantages aren't really that impressive. We are getting wider CPUs in other words CPUs with more cores, but they aren't really getting much faster in sequential workloads. And this brings us to the true deciding factor for the future of mainstream microprocessors, software. You've probably heard a lot of talk about parallel compute and threaded workloads, and many hardware companies have been promoting a move to parallel code aggressively. After all, if we can't get more performance out of clock cycles alone, then a move to parallel workloads is where we will find performance increase pieces, right? Well, it's not that simple. Nvidia, for instance, have been doing a lot of talks on this topic over the last few years in an effort to convince software developers that GPUs are the future of computing because of their parallel processing capabilities. And for a while, that certainly looked to be the case, at least for some workloads. AMD have also shaken up the industry with a move to wider CPUs with lots more cores. In the summer of this year, they will be introducing 
16 core CPUs in the mainstream market, Intel will have no choice but to respond with many core CPUs themselves, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw 12 and 16 core CPUs coming from them this year also, even if they have to glue two 9900Ks together to get there. But no one is really stopping to ask the question, what can this move to parallel compute really do for me, the consumer? What are we going to do with 16 core CPUs? Are games going to run faster? And at what point does adding more cores stop making a difference in performance? So the first problem with parallel code is that programmers are taught, and have always been taught and will continue to be taught, that programming is done sequentially, and most high-level programming languages are designed to be written sequentially and to make processes run code sequentially also. As a simple example, let's just add a couple of variables and store them into a third. So we declare the variables as integers, and then we do the operation. The CPU will run three cycles for this bit of code. It reads the values from the register addresses, does the adding operation, and then stores the result in another address. So our simple code runs in three cycles. But this whole operation can be done in parallel in just one cycle, like so. We have those two separate instructions running at the same time. It's the same code, but because it's being run in one cycle instead of three, it's obviously going to execute faster. So what processor designers will do is try and convince programmers that if they make their code to run in parallel, then their applications will run much faster, and that's where we will be getting our performance increases with the next generation of microprocessors. Processes. And to some extent, that is indeed the case. Programmers, on the hand, will probably say that the hardware should convert their sequential code automatically into parallel. But after decades of research in this area, no one has found an easy solution to make this happen seamlessly. A common misconception that a lot of people have, and that is perpetuated by some hardware companies, is that if we can just convert all of our code from sequential to parallel, we will magically gain as much performance as we have cause. What these companies never tell you is that there is a law for parallel performance. You know how it is in technology, there's always a law. In this case, it's called Amdahl's law, which follows this formula. So here, n is the number of processes or cores, and p is the parallel percentage. In other words, how much of a program can be run in parallel. So if we look at a common program that a lot of you probably use, let's say Google Chrome, p for Chrome is in the 50% range. That's how much of Chrome's code can run in parallel. So if we chart this in a graph, you can see that Chrome's performance gets faster going from one core to two cores and keeps going up slightly as we go all the way up to 16 cores, at which point it plateaus. What Amdahl's law tells us is that the speed up of multiple processes is limited by the sequential part of the program. In other words, having 16 cores or 65,000 cores makes no difference to performance if only 50% of the program can be parallelized, because obviously the other 50% will always be dependent on clock cycles. But does this apply to a workload that has a higher percentage of parallelization? Let's upset Jensen Huang, shall we? Let's look at ray tracing. It just so happens that ray tracing is one of the most parallel operations that we can have, up there in the 95% range. Each ray that is being traced through the scene is an independent calculation, and multiple calculations need to be distributed across the scene for each ray. This is why the RTX cards have RT cores. These cores are designed to compute each of those rays all at once, in parallel. This means that we can actually predict with some accuracy how much faster the next RTX cards will be in ray tracing and if the performance will plateau at some point. So the RTX 2080 Ti has 48 RT cores, so we will use that as our baseline. Let's say that the RTX 2 cards that Nvidia will launch later this year or early next year like the 3080 Ti will have 64 RT cores. Using Amdahl's formula, we see that that would represent an increase 
increase in ray tracing performance of only about 12%. 12% sounds rather modest, at least from a marketing perspective. I would guess that Jensen will want to be on stage and announce a much larger performance increase to justify the RTX 3080 Ti costing $1600 after all. So let's say that the 3080 Ti has 128 RT cores. That's an increase of 27% in ray tracing performance. 27% sounds like a more impressive increase in ray tracing, so 128RT cores is probably what the next RTX cards will have. But can we just add more and more RT cores and get ever increasing performance? As you've probably guessed, no. The increase in parallel performance will top out at 4096RT cores. But most importantly, you can see that there will be very small increases in performance above 128 RT cores. While Nvidia might hope that ray tracing will help GPUs stay relevant, the reality is that to get even a 5 or 10% increase in performance with the next generations of RTX cards, we're looking at a massive increase in the number of RT cores, and therefore massive investments into node rings and huge expensive dies to fit all of these transistors in. If you need a further evidence of the shortening lifetime of the GPU is a separate unit, well, there you have it. We are at the tail end of rasterized performance increases and not even ASIC type of solutions for something like ray tracing will prevent the GPU from becoming obsolete, because those two will soon come to a limit in how much performance we can get out of them. This also shows us what the future holds for AMD's Zen CPUs. There is a lot that can be done to improve performance in many applications, like games for instance, but there's also a limit to how many cores they can benefit from. Let's say that a best case scenario would be a 75% parallelization of some of the more demanding programs we use. So that's games and productivity software like Adobe Premiere and Photoshop. At 75% parallel, performance will level off at 128 cores, and there's actually very little reason to go beyond 32 cores. Think about this, even if our pool of programmers suddenly decided to radically change the code in programs to be parallel, or if we found a way to translate high-level sequential code to machine-level parallel code, programs will be tapping out the parallel performance pool at 32 cores, from which point you hit diminishing returns, hitting a hard wall at 128 cores. Now before you run to the comments and write wrong, remember that I'm talking about the common workloads that the vast majority of people need to run, like games and productivity software. I'm not talking about server workloads, neural networks, etc. There are workloads that can benefit from even millions of of course, for instance if you were creating a model of the human brain, but that's far from being a common workload unless you're Steve Ferber. So now you can justify buying that Ryzen 3800X with 16 cores for $500, assuming software will be optimized to utilize all those cores that is. And we can also predict how many more cores AMD will bring to the mainstream. It looks like after 32 cores the performance increases will be too small for what those chips will cost, so it's possible that mainstream CPUs will settle for the 32 core range. So we've looked at the hardware companies and their transition into system in package in the high-end parts. We've looked at the software side of things, where we see a limitation in how much we can take advantage of parallelization. But what about the market? What hardware do consumers actually want or need? At some point, people will realize that we don't actually need the hardware that companies are trying to sell us. I mean, I love technology progress as much as anyone else, but take mobile phones for example. Why on earth do we even have 8 core SoCs in our phones? To look at memes on Instagram? I suspect that the real reason the mobile phone industry continues to thrive is because we keep breaking our phones, not because we actually need to upgrade. Now new form factors can sustain demand, and here the need for flexible hardware can dictate the research and development that goes 
using the chip making. On the desktop, from the perspective of the user, it looks like the market will be divided into two segments, the traditional high-end market and the emerging thin client market. Oracle was the first company to attempt to popularize the idea of the thin client, which is basically a simple computer with modest specs that is optimized for running remote networked applications that are running on a server somewhere. Oracle's ideas were ahead of its time and their products didn't really gain significant market share. But Google's attempts at the same system have been very successful, with the most popular thin clients today being the Chromebooks running Chrome OS. Microsoft are also rumored to be using this system in the next Xbox console with two different models, one traditional console with mid to high-end components and a thin client version with basic functionality that will run most of the processing remotely in the cloud. The biggest advantage to thin clients is of course price. If thin clients like cheap laptops and cheap consoles can satisfy the needs of the market, then getting an expensive machine will be seen as a luxury. There will still be a market for high-end performance, but it's possible that the masses will stick with commodity products. Another product that Microsoft will probably try and bring to the market at some point will be an ARM-based mobile thin client. So a laptop or Surface tablet with multi-day battery that runs a version of Office completely in the cloud. This will have a virtual SIM card so that the device is always connected to the internet and will be much cheaper than the version with expensive components like x86 Intel SoCs, whether they're 3D stacked system in packages or not. Intel processors and AMD ones for that matter will have very little to offer in a world where thin clients with cheap modest components are all the market needs. In upcoming videos, we'll look at fabrication processes in more detail, including 2.5D and 3D stacking. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss those. This video is made possible by my awesome patrons. I will soon have alternative forms for supporting my work, but for now, for just $1 per month, you can join them and have exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where we talk daily about technology and other topics. If you can't contribute financially at this time, then please give this video a like and share it on social media, as that really helps. Thanks for watching, and until the next one.